remember fondly when I was invited as the special guest of honor to the Seventh General Assembly that was held in Ho at the headquarters of the church. And um, I was received by Reverend Agidi, who had taken over from Reverend Aminu at the time. And um, I got the same rousing welcome that I received when I entered EP Church Ghana Medina. The same welcome you gave me this morning is the same one I received there. I ask for divine utterance to make sense to you in what I'm going to say. But I noticed your team was plowing the land for new life. And as a person who was a son of first a politician and then a farmer, my father was a politician and after he left politics, he went into farming. And for a person who myself is engaged in agriculture and love farming very much, you cannot plant new seed unless you have plowed the land. After you have harvested the crop, for the next season when the rain has fallen, you need to go in and till the land again before you put new seed in it in order that you can get new life. And so this is a very apt, apt theme. And I believe it was selected with a lot of appreciation for the meaning of what it is. But the interpretation I also give it is that plowing is the most tedious part of the farming pro profession. And so in any season, the most hard work is how you plow the field. And how you plow the field also determines the quality of the crops that you will harvest. And so plowing is a very important aspect of farming, indeed the most critical aspect of farming. And so it teaches us that in farming you have to go through the tedious procedure before you sow and then you harvest. When you harvest, you are happy because you see the produce, you're going to eat some, you're going to sell some on the market, you're going to make money, and so you're happy. But when you're applying, you're applying in tears. You're sowing in tears because that is the back-breaking part. Harvesting is the joyous part of it. And so in life, we go through the tedious aspects of life and we go through the joyous aspects of life. Life was made like that by God. It was not made to be joyous all through, from birth to death. You will go through tribulations. And the tribulations harden you and prepare you for the period of joy. And so it is important that all of us realize when we're going through tribulations and use that as a learning experience for the time that God will bless us with the periods of joy. You cannot profit if you do not invest. And so we have a wise saying that says, suffer to gain. You can't gain without suffering. And so these are all idioms and statements that must guide us through life. If you take the Bible, some of the most famous personalities in the Bible, and I always like to quote the example of David first, and then after that, Joseph. David was a poor shepherd boy. His brothers were soldiers, and his brothers were at the war front. And soldiers were very respected because they were brave and they were fighters, and they wore armor, and you know, they were held highly by the society. But who was a shepherd boy in the bush looking after his father's sheep? And yet, at the time that their nation faced its greatest threat, it was this little shepherd boy who God chose to lead his nation out of the tribulation that Goliath and his people were posing to them. And so with a simple sling, he was able to slay uh, Goliath. And everybody knows the tribulation David went through at the hands of Saul. When Saul realized that God's anointing was leaving him and going to David, you know the kinds of evil plots that he tried against David. And yet God saw David through and eventually made David king. David 
as king, I would not say was the best of people. He made his mistakes, and he did a lot of wrong things. But the thing is, God could see into David's heart and knew that David was loyal to him, God, and no other God. And so that's why the sins that David committed, God always forgave him and still uh, put a lot of abundant grace and blessings on him. And so we need to learn from the life of David and even Joseph. Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery and um, they thought that they had gotten rid of their father's favorite son. But God had a purpose for sending him into slavery and into tribulation. He was sold as a slave, he went into prison, but then eventually he became the savior of his family and his tribe because he became the chief minister of Egypt. And so we go through tribulations and hardships as preparation for periods of joy and happiness. And if you take people's personality and people's lives to the life of nations, because sometimes nations go through tribulations and hardship, but then we should still realize that those tribulations we are going through are preparing us for the period when we shall also realize joy. Your life and the life of all Ghanaians, each single life, sums up with the life of all Ghanaians to be the life of the nation. And so the experiences you go through are the kind of experiences that the nation goes through. So I always say that in hardship and in troubles, we do what? We give thanks. In joy and happiness, we do what? We give thanks. And so in all things, we must do what? We must give thanks to God, both in our personal lives and in our lives as a nation. My brothers and sisters, leadership is not an easy thing. And we must always pray for leaders. I've been there before, and I know what it's like. Sleepless nights. And I'm sure my successor is also having very sleepless nights. If you are the leader even of a small parish like this, the kinds of problems I'm sure Reverend Osiakwa has to handle are just a microcosm of the kinds of problems that President Anado must be handling uh, by now. And so, as our divine shepherds tell us, we must always pray for our leaders. And we must also always respect our leaders. Indeed, if you do not even like the personality in the position or in the office, you must show respect to the office because you don't know when you yourself will find yourself there or your son will find himself there or your relative will find himself there or even somebody you like will find himself there. If you have developed the culture of denigrating the office, you'll find that when you get there, you have so denigrated the office that you cannot command the kind of respect that you also think you deserve. And so, it doesn't mean that we mustn't criticize our leaders when they go wrong. We must criticize them. But we must criticize them in decorous language. Aside from that, our leaders too must learn to accept criticism. Criticism is good for progress. Because if people tell you only the favorable things you want to continue hearing, both in your personal life and as a leader of an organization, you will run the organization into the ground. Or you will find yourself as an individual in a wrong place that you did not intend to be. And so it's important for people who are friends, who know you, who have a stake in your life, to criticize you when you're going astray. And we must take that criticism in good faith. But it also depends on how that criticism is packaged. 
if you want somebody to accept your criticism, you must package it properly. And if you package it properly, it becomes easy for the person to absorb. And when he absorbs it, the necessary correction would be made, even if at the time he doesn't appear to have accepted it. Because you package it well, it will be in the back of his mind. And unconsciously or consciously, he will make the corrections that you want to see. And so I want to say that Ghana is a great country, and we have the potential to be even greater. But the first thing we need to do is to believe in ourselves that we can be a greater nation. Unfortunately, because of our social discourse, it makes us believe that we are a basket case. All the countries that have progressed and developed and made it in this world that we admire today and want to cross oceans to be able to go there, were able to reach where they've reached because they believed in themselves. But here, anytime you listen to the social discourse in every medium, it is like Ghana is the worst country in the world. If you had never been to Ghana and you were coming here, you were just listening to the media and social media and all that, you think we are at war in this country. But like I said, if we must build a great nation, the first thing is to have a sense of national belief that our country is cut out for greatness and all of us must play our part in order that our country can make progress. I always give the example of a, a boat. If we're all in a boat together and all of us have oars for rowing and half of us are trying to row the boat forward and the other half are trying to row the boat backwards, where will the boat go? It will, stand, it will stay in the same location. But at least if the majority of people are rowing forward, and even let's assume that in every society there are, I don't like using this Mensa because it's, it's some people's name. <laughs> in every society, there are rebels who whatever you do will try to sabotage the effort and row backwards. But if the majority are rowing forward, Despite the attempt of the minority to row backwards, the boat will move in the right direction. And so, on this occasion, I want to congratulate the church. 50 years in the life of any church organization is no mean achievement. And I remember when the tragedy befell this church that Reverend Amenu talked about. It sent shock across the whole country because it was the first time in recent memory at the time that members of a congregation of a church like that or members of a family like that had been involved in such a tragedy. But I'm happy to see that the church has bounced back and 50 years on, the church is strong. And so on this occasion, we remember those who passed away. And then at the same time, for those who survived and are still struggling with the effects of that tragedy, we tell you, God is not finished with you. And God is laying brighter things for you. May he give you long life and good health. May we live to come again 70, uh, 25 years from now and celebrate the 75th anniversary of this church. <laughs> And it is my hope that the next time that you invite me and I visit, we will be in the new church premises. <laughs>